when she said no, the president said goodbye. We can look like absolute idiots, nobody knows. Natural disasters caused $160 billion in damage around the world in 2018. And the most expensive catastrophes all happened in the U.S., according to a German insurance firm. California's campfire took the dubious title of being the most expensive, followed by hurricanes Michael and Florence. Almost a year after the Parkland shooting, a Vice News investigation found that at least 215 school districts have adopted policies allowing teachers and school staff to carry guns. That puts the policy in five more states, meaning a total of at least 466 school districts in 19 states now allow armed staff. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is in the Middle East to build support for the White House's hardline stance on Iran. And today, Iran's supreme leader shared some thoughts about American sanctions and the people who reimposed them. Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, the world's richest man, and his wife McKinsey are getting a divorce. The couple announced the split in a joint statement on Twitter that wasn't exactly dripping in sentimentality, saying that the couple will remain friends and co-parents, and also remain partners in ventures and projects. No one was really expecting President Trump's big primetime address last night to break the logjam on the shutdown, but they probably weren't expecting the day after to look quite so comically hopeless, a kind of red rover of Washington gridlock. First, Trump spoke in the Oval Office again to say that federal workers were standing with him. Over at the Capitol, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Schumer gathered some federal workers together to say, no, they weren't. Then Trump himself went over to the Capitol to meet with congressional Republicans and say that they were standing with him the Republicans are totally unified. Then Democratic and Republican leaders all went over to the White House to talk with the president. The president walked out of that meeting and left it to everyone else to spin what happened. Again, we saw a temper tantrum because he couldn't get his way and he just walked out of the meeting. Well, the president walked into the room, and passed out candy. <laughs> it's true. It was true. Never raised the voice. But I don't. I, I don't recall him ever raising his voice or slamming his hand. By the way, we've learned the candy was mini candy bars like Butterfingers and Peanut Butter Cups. Anyway, it doesn't really matter whose account you believe, because we know one thing. The government isn't going to open anytime soon. And that has the administration trying to ward off a huge backlash by selectively reopening parts of the government. But as a former Office of Management and Budget lawyer in the Obama administration told us, there are laws about these things. When the government shuts down, things aren't supposed to happen except in very uh, rare, particular circumstances. So obviously, if you're still funded, you know, sometimes uh, certain agencies will have funding, then you can continue, you have money, no problem. If you're doing something to protect life and safety, so uh, the FBI you know, would be uh, an example. You know, we don't sort of close down the prisons or stop chasing bad guys. All that stuff keeps happening. Constitutional duties of the president, uh, those continue. So uh, commander in chief responsibilities, that sort of thing. And then what's called necessary implication. This is sort of the bigger catch-all. What that means is if Congress has provided a pot of money, uh, but hasn't actually funded the people necessary to do the thing with that pot of money, it can continue in certain limited circumstances. Take the food stamp program SNAP, used by 39 million Americans. That's an example of a program that has money that is supposed to go to people, so the government gets it to them. It officially runs out of money February 1st, but that's a PR nightmare for any administration. People not being able to afford food is not a good look. So the USDA has figured out a way to provide benefits through February. It's unlikely this trick will work in March. Another example, national parks are normally closed during a shutdown, but parks are popular. So the Trump administration is just gonna move money from entrance fees around to provide immediate assistance and services to highly visited parks even though those fees are supposed to go to upkeep in future projects. And then there are those beloved annual windfalls, tax refunds. The average individual refund is around $3,000. In the past, and by past I mean the beginning of December, 
The Treasury Department wrote into their shutdown plan that the workers who issued refund checks couldn't work. It's literally on page 13. But on Monday, the administration said that despite previous determinations that the IRS couldn't pay out refunds during a shutdown, they're gonna do it anyway. I mean, this is a political decision, not a legal decision. In fact, what the IRS is doing is contrary to law. So you're saying it's illegal? It's illegal. Why is it illegal? Well, the way we know that, first of all, IRS told us they couldn't do it. They told us this in 2013, 2014, 2015. They told us during the Trump administration in 2018 and most recently in 2019. But even stepping back, why in particular is that the case? Because there's no requirement from Congress that tax refunds go out at any specific moment in time. But does it matter that it's illegal if everyone wants it to happen? So first of all, yes, it should matter it's illegal. Two people, you know, the fact that uh, everybody involved likes the outcome, if it's breaking the law, it's breaking the law. We have a constitution for a reason, you know, so that's problematic. But also, there are people that are being hurt by this. Small businesses that can't get loans, farmers that can't get loans, new homeowners that can't get loans. You mean as in they are not being made whole even if the tax refunds are going out to individuals? Why are we picking and choosing? So why has the Trump administration decided that people will break the law to help people with tax refunds? We're not gonna break the law to help small businesses. We're not gonna break the law to help Secret Service, there's a reason that we have a rule of law. It's important that it be upheld. Congressman Mike Thompson hasn't been able to do this in a long time. Introduce a piece of gun control legislation that might actually pass the House of Representatives. For six years, we've been working to find the most effective and the most efficient way to help save lives. The new bill expands background checks to cover just about every kind of firearm sale or transfer. Currently, federal law only requires checks when buying guns from federally licensed dealers. That leaves 22% of guns that were acquired without any background check process at all, often online or in private transactions. The fact that the bill is finally moving is just one more consequence of Democrats taking over the House. You're in the majority here in the House, so you will be able to get this bill through the House. In the first 100 days. This bill has been something I've been working on for over six years, and I've had twice as many Republican co-authors as I have now, uh, and yet we couldn't even get a hearing on the bill under the Republican leadership. But now we're gonna get a hearing, we're gonna get a vote, we're gonna pass a bill. But passing a bill in the House is still just a gesture. The last time a measure like this one came up in the aftermath of Sandy Hook, it couldn't get past a filibuster in a Democratic-controlled Senate. Now, with the Republicans in control, it's unclear whether Majority Leader Mitch McConnell would even allow this bill to get to the floor. Although everything everyone knows about Mitch McConnell indicates it ain't gonna happen. That doesn't mean there aren't good political reasons to do it anyway. Enter the Parkland kids. If Mitch McConnell does not introduce this bill in the Senate, he is saying that he does not believe every gun sale should have a background check. He's saying that it's totally fine for somebody with a history of domestic abuse to be able to go out and legally obtain a firearm without a background check that could have been previously prevented. And there are 22 Republican senators that are up for re-election in the Senate uh, in 2020. And so if they vote against this bill or if it's not even introduced, you know, the American people know who to vote out. That's really what this spectacle was all about and what this whole Congress might be about for Pelosi and company. Democrats might not be able to make this bill a law, just like they won't be able to pass their next splashy legislation. But they can force Republicans to take an uncomfortable public stance. Do you really think that this bill can get through the Senate, or are you trying to sort of lay down a marker? Are you trying to send a message of some sort? Well, first, I think the bill does have a chance to get through the Senate. Now, you know, it could, it could happen that Mitch McConnell just says what Paul Ryan said for six years, we're not taking it up. But if that happens, boy, that's gonna be a good juxtaposition across the country in the 2020 elections. Today, members of Britain's parliament confronted Prime Minister Theresa May on the deal she's brought back from Brussels, setting the terms for Brexit. In less than a week, they'll vote on whether to ratify it. If her 
deal is defeated next week, will the Prime Minister do the right thing and call a general election? Uh, no. Many young Brits are sick of the shouting and the vitriol. Our future, our choice, has a different way to get their message out. Now, if Parliament can't decide, it's up to the people to decide. That's why we're asking for a people's vote. And according to the biggest poll since the referendum, 53% of the public agrees. They've demonstrated their opposition to Brexit by holding a funeral for it, publicly destroying May's withdrawal agreement, and schooling Conservatives on how EU law itself could be applied to limit immigration. Immigrants have to benefit a country, not be a burden on the country. What if we had a situation where, you, in order to come to this country, you needed to either have a job and have enough money that you would not be a burden? Wouldn't that be good? Yes, I agree. That is literally EU law. That really flew on the internet, yeah. I think it got like over a million. 1.2 million. 1.2 million views, yeah. <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Spokesperson Femi Olawole is 28. He's worked in Europe. His friends still live there. He'd always thought of himself as European. I worked in France, Belgium, Austria, without needing so much as a work permit. Also, it also makes holidaying in Europe a lot easier. We're a generation that's more connected to the outside world than any before us. This is Brussels. This Brexit Brussels. takes away the opportunities we currently have to live, work and love in 31 countries across, across Europe. We want to democratically stop Brexit because we think it's a complete disaster for our country. Will Dry, just 20, is the group's co-founder. He worries about what economic forecasts have said about the impact of Brexit. But in 2016, he bought the promises of the Leave campaign. If I side one the first referendum, I've only changed my mind because I think the options have become so clear and that, that you can't get a better deal than the one we've already got. We don't want the Prime Minister's deal and we don't want the chaos of no deal. Will Dry and members like Dominic Brind feel like they've been cut out of the process, ignored. Dominic's grandmother is German. He feels deeply European and wanted a chance to study there. In my, in my, my year in school, the whole cohort wasn't old enough to vote. And I remember the day after the vote, I hadn't slept at all. Most people were just looking slightly surprised, angry, confused, and just annoyed they hadn't had their say. The group thinks that if they get a shot at the vote, they could very well change the result. Young people voted overwhelmingly for Remain in 2016, and data suggests they now want to remain even more. Meanwhile, 1.4 million more young people have come of voting age. Though getting them to vote is a different story. While almost two-thirds of young people voted last time, older voters had a higher turnout. The before Brexit is anywhere near completed in 2021, we will have a population that voted against it. But many see a second vote as betraying the will of the British people. You scum! We knew what we were voting for. This is the middle upper class. We sneering at the working class. Opponents have threatened the campaign and organisers personally think racial abuse is every day, two days, and then threats of violence is every two, three months, and then in February somebody posted my home address online. But they need to get offline and engage with voters face to face if they want to change minds. Do you think Brexit is going well? No, it's rubbish. Doncaster is one of the heartlands of the Leave vote. It's a post-industrial town that never fully recovered from the loss of mining and manufacturing and seven out of 10 people here chose leave. There's no point just talking to Remainers. What's needed is a national conversation. And so that's why we go specifically to those areas. What did you want from Brexit? Well, obviously I wanted the, the best thing. Mm. For, for the country? Good. Absolutely, for the country. absolutely, absolutely. For all we know, it might be better for Doncaster. But the... It could be. There may be a public swing to remain and to hold a second vote, but many roadblocks stand in the way. The legislation for the original referendum took seven months to become law. But with MPs divided over everything Theresa May has come up with, putting the question to the people could be the best solution. I think there is a 70% chance of getting a people's vote now. And yes, it might be divisive and it's not a silver bullet, but I definitely think it's less bad than the other two options. But yeah, <laughs> we, we, could, we could look like absolute idiots. Nobody knows.
This is Nyango Star. He's an apple that's been inhabited by the spirit of a dead cat, and he's kind of a celebrity in Japan, thanks to his impressive heavy metal drum covers. In October, he went viral in the U.S. when a video of him performing became an instant meme. Nyango Star is what's known in Japan as a yurukyara, which translates loosely to chill mascot. Why is he called Nyango Star? まず青森県はリンゴが有名なのとニャンというのは猫の鳴き声でビートルズのドラマーはリンゴスターで青森県の特産物のリンゴと猫のニャンとドラマーのリンゴスターが合わさってニャンゴスターです。Japan <笑> is full of yurukyara. There are over 1500 officially recognized characters. And in 2014, there was even a scare that some would be forcibly retired by the government. But instead of haunting tourist traps and advertising sports teams like most American mascots, Japanese yurukata represent everything from police departments to restaurants to government initiatives, like Kanzokun, the elephant slash liver who just wants you to get tested for hepatitis. Lots of towns have them too. Nyango Star represents Kuruishi City a rural farming community in Japan's northern prefecture of Aomori, which is best known for its apples. What do people normally do for a living in Kuroshi? Do you think Nyango Star is a good representative of Kuruishi? Kuroishi the city's mayor, Ken Takahi, is looking to capitalize on Nyango Star's viral success to improve the city's economy. What are your biggest struggles as mayor of Kuruishi? Does Nyango Star help you do that? Nyango Star But Ken Takahi isn't just selling apples, he's selling the city. And the stakes are higher than just local business. The entire existence of the town is at stake. Across the country, Japan's population is declining and aging, but rural areas like Kuruishi's prefecture, Aomori, are shrinking at more than two times the national average. With his already small town continuing to shrink, Mayor Takahi is looking outside of Kuruishi to generate revenue. In 2016, he introduced Nyango Star to Being Inc., an entertainment company based in Tokyo. And ever since, they've been working hard behind the scenes to build his image. Nyango Star no T-shirts are a lot of shirts. Ato cushion, ato nuigurumi dattari, passcase. Oh, cool. Kitty chan to no collaboration goods ato. Yeah. That seems like a big deal. Besides the merch that's here, how else are you using Nyango's image to sell products? CM character to stay, Ringo no yogurt on the CM in Stain Stadi, Pepsi Cola on CM song, Kareva Stain or Stay, Dramo Tatai de Itari. To each one, Saikin no Shigoto Dato, Ega Bohemia Love Soti no, Nihon no PR Dogan for the more Kareva, Dramo Tatai de Itari. Konnichiwa! It's taboo to acknowledge Yudukera as people in costumes. And many, like Nyango Star, keep their identity a secret. We do know the person in Nyango Star's suit is also his anonymous creator, who owns all the trademarks to Nyango Star's name and image. That means the same person doing the drumming also earns all the direct revenue. Do you think part of the appeal is the kind of human element of imagining the person drumming that hard? 
inside a very like hot, sweaty costume. <laughs> その質問についてはちょっと答えられないというかちょっとそこは難しいかなと思います。Does any of the money that is made from Yango Star products go back to Kuroishi? Kuroishi には彼が黒石市だったり青森の中で、えー、とライブをすることによって青森県以外のところから東京だったり大阪だったりいろんな全国から青森県に集まるのでそのことによって観光だったりとか地元の飲食だったりとかお土産だったりとかニャンゴスターグッズだったりそういった意味ですごく青森県だったり黒石に還元されていると思います。Being Inc. wouldn't disclose how much money ニャンゴスター has profited, but they did say it's reinvested into his touring expenses. In the three years since ニャンゴスター was created, He's proven that he can definitely move products. But it's still not clear whether he'll be able to combat the effects of urban migration for Kuruishi. Have you ever seen a Yurukia in a situation like this, like playing at a, a show? <laughs> Do you think you'll buy any Nyango Star merch? <laughs> Does he make you want to visit Kuruishi? Oh my.